let's pray and we'll dig in. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you that we come to you not based on our merit, but based on your love, on your forgiveness, on the merit of Jesus Christ. Lord, we, uh, we thank you that the kingdom of God um, is not a meritocracy, but it runs on mercy. And God, we thank you for the opportunity to celebrate that today. Lord, I pray for those um, who are gathered with us in person, for those who are sitting at home, um, who feel the weight of their inadequacy and their failure. Um, Lord, who are, are beaten down by their own sin and even by their lack of desire for you. Lord, I pray that you would use our time in your word today to, to open up eyes, to heighten that desire, to give us hope, uh, Lord, that you might yet redeem us, that you might yet recreate us, that you might yet accept us and enjoy us, and that we might know the joy of walking closely with you. Amen. All right. Have you ever been invited to an event and you really didn't want to go because, you know, the, the invitation was flashy, but you said in your heart, this is going to be really boring. You know, maybe, maybe it was a birthday party for a younger cousin or, or maybe, it was, maybe it was like a high school dance or something like that. Maybe it was even a wedding, which is a theme that we're going to be looking at. And, and you got the invitation and like mom was excited, dad was excited, other people were excited, but this didn't look very good to you. Uh, maybe your parents plan a trip to the Grand Canyon. And you're like, great, nine days to stare at dirt. This is going to be amazing. You know, but then you actually get there and you see the Grand Canyon and you're tempted to fall on your knees and worship at a God who could create something so amazing. For many of us, that's our experience of the Christian life, of the kingdom of God, of life with God living under his rule and reign. On the front end, when we first heard the invitation, it really didn't sound all that great. We weren't sure that we were interested in that, but when we actually came to the party, it was beyond our imagination. C.S. Lewis says that the reason we often don't seek God is because we don't know what we're missing. He says on the best of days, we're like children who are content to make mud pies in the slums because we cannot imagine what could be meant by the invitation of a day at the beach. This morning, we're continuing our series in Matthew, and it's called, Are You Ready for the King? And we're looking at the third of three parables where Jesus answers the objections of the chief priests and the Pharisees and basically the, the religious establishment in Jerusalem. He's answering their questions as they question and they push back against his authority. They push back and they say, what right do you have to preach and to teach and, and to heal people, and to, to raise the dead? Who gave you authority to do that? In essence, they're asking, who gave you authority to upstage us? Who gave you authority to steal our thunder? Because we think that we deserve to be running the show. We, we paid our dues. We did our time. We climbed the ladder. We earned it. We deserve it. Who are you to come and, and upset the established apple cart? What Jesus is going to essentially tell them is that the kingdom of God is not a meritocracy. You do not earn it. You do not deserve it. The kingdom of God runs on mercy. And it's a delight in God's mercy that fills our hearts with joy and, and puts us in a place where we experience our everyday lives as a lavish feast of God. That's what Jesus is saying in this parable. So, so this morning, we're going to hear Jesus compare life under God's rule and reign to a wedding feast. We'll see that, that some, they, they basically thought they had a better offer. They got the invitation. They looked at it and said, eh, this doesn't really look all that great. We're going to see others that, that they saw the invitation and like, eh, well, sure, sure, I'll come, but it's not all that big deal. You know, I, I, don't need, I don't need to dress up. There's, it's not that important an event. There's nobody to honor here. I'm the one to be honored here. I, I'm just going to walk in and do my thing because I deserve to be there. Most of all, we're going to see our opportunity to be counted among the few who recognize the incredible honor that it is to be invited into the kingdom of God. The, the incredible privilege to recognize that we do not deserve this. We're the beggars, we're the broken, we're the weak. 
We're the homeless guy who was hanging out in Liberty Plaza a few minutes ago. And all of a sudden, he got invited to a feast. And, and when they pass the mashed potatoes, we cheer because we know that, that we do not deserve our seat at the table, and yet by the grace of God, we are here. Amen? And oh, the opportunity to invite others to enjoy that grace. That's, that's where we're going. All right, so let's jump in. Matthew chapter 22, verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. All right, first off, what is the kingdom of heaven? Is it a people? Is it a place? Is it, is it eternity? Um, Matthew, he talks about the kingdom of heaven. The, the other gospels, they talk about the kingdom of God. Like, what's the difference? Why are they doing that? Are, are they two different things? Again, people, place, what are we talking about here? Uh, we need to remember that, that for Matthew, he's writing primarily to a Jewish audience. Okay, so one of the things about, about the Jewish culture is that with the Ten Commandments, you know, don't use the Lord's name in vain. They have this huge, rigid, legalistic emphasis where, where they're not going to use the proper name for God. They're not going to say Yahweh. But man, if they can avoid even using the word God, they're going to avoid it because, you know, they, they don't want to unintentionally cross this line. So whereas others refer to this as the kingdom of God, the other gospels, when Matthew is recording Jesus' words, he refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. But, but what is the kingdom of heaven? What is the kingdom of God? Again, is it a people? Is it a place? The kingdom of God, the, the kingdom of heaven, it, it's not a destination, it's an activity. It's, it's not a people or a place. It is the active, dynamic rule and reign of God in the world. It's coming under his authority. It's coming under his leadership. It's embracing his rightful place as, as the king of all creation. Jesus is answering the question, what does it look like to live under God's leadership? And what he says about living under God's leadership is that it is like the most amazing feast that you could ever imagine. He, he, he says it's, it's like this amazing spread where you show up and they've got the Thanksgiving turkey and, and they also have steak. They've got filet mignon. For, for some of you who are like, I'm not into the fancy meats, they have, they have chicken fried chicken, which I don't know exactly what that means, but it's, I think it's like extra frying that's going on there. That's, that's not really my thing, but, but they've also got pulled pork. They've also got bacon. They, they got absolutely everything there. They got, they got French bread and they've got, they've got Italian desserts. Okay, they've, 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 got, they've got cheesecake. They've got chocolate-covered raspberries. You know, for those of you who are into craft beers and fine wine, they've, they've got that. For, for people like me, they've got bottomless raspberry lemonade. You know, the good stuff, the simply lemonade stuff, not the off-brand stuff. And it just keeps on coming. Here's the great thing about this feast. It's a supernatural feast. You gorge yourself and you still don't get fat. You still don't feel sick afterward because, because here's the deal. What we're actually gorging ourselves on is not bacon. It's something better than bacon. What we're actually gorging ourselves on is the love and grace of God. So man, you, you take in more of that, you eat more of that, you get healthier. It's the most amazing feast that you can ever imagine. That is the picture that Jesus paints of living under the leadership of God. Even better than a Thanksgiving feast, this is a wedding feast. God is the king, and he's throwing a wedding feast for his son. His son's getting married. Jesus is the bridegroom. He's come to be united with his people, with his bride. So the nation of Israel, they're pictured as a people invited to a royal wedding feast. But sadly, many of them believed that they had better offers. Verse 2, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding feast for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. So there's something, there's something a little different going on here culturally. Um, they'd already been invited. In our culture, you might think of it as the RSVP, and they'd already responded, yes. They, they, they got the RSVP and said, yeah, yeah, we're coming. And then they didn't come. So back in the day, a wedding feast, it was a multi-day affair. 
For, from the time that they announced it, prep, preparations, they, they roll into motion. But, but for all the people they're inviting to this royal banquet, it's, it's not entirely clear how long it's going to take to prepare. So they start preparing, they start gathering the animals, setting up the decorations, getting, getting the gowns in order, all of the things that they need to do. Eventually, the cooks go into motion. They, um, you know, they, they start grilling, they start chopping, they start doing their thing. But nobody knows exactly when this wedding is going to take place. Nobody knows what time they're supposed to show up, and that's fine because nobody has a watch anyway. Okay, so the way they handled that in the ancient world is that, that, that days in advance, they send out the RSVP and everyone says, yeah, I'm coming. And because they recognize the incredible honor, the incredible privilege that it is to be invited to this event, they, they basically clear out their schedule for the next, the next week or two. Because this isn't going to be like, like a, a two-hour, you know, little thing where the preacher says a few things and, and like a couple of people dance and then everyone goes home, you know, kind of lackluster. Well, well that, was a, that was a mediocre way to spend an evening. This, this is a multi-day party, okay? This, this is a lavish feast that goes on and on and on and on. So they're blocking out a couple of weeks of their schedule. They don't know exactly when it's coming, but it's an honor. They're excited to be there. And, and when that moment comes... Man, they're, they're, they're sitting on the doorstep. They're, they're waiting with bated breath. Is, is this going to be the moment where they say that the feast is ready and then that moment comes? The moment finally comes. The, the herald rides by on his horse. He says, it's time, guys. The moment of the wedding feast has arrived. They're like, eh. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I don't think so. I'm not, I'm not feeling it today. In the past, they'd RSVP, they'd say, yeah, we're coming. But in the moment, they did not come. I told you last week, as we began to look at these parables, I want us to find ourselves in the story. Because ultimately, these, these parables, they're all about this, this question of authority. Who's in charge? Who are we going to follow? How are we going to live? Are we going to do our life our way, or are we going to live under the rule and reign of God? So I want us to, to seek out this opportunity to find ourselves in the story because I think some of us are living here. Maybe you've been baptized. Maybe, maybe at some point in the past you've prayed a sinner's prayer. The RSVP, the RSVP it came in the mail and effectively said, yeah, I'm coming. But when the moment came, you have not come. You accepted the invitation, says, yes, I want to live under the rule and reign of God. I want to be a part of this party. But in everyday life, you are not feasting on your God. You're not feasting on his love and his grace. In your everyday life, you, you look at all the other distractions and you say, you know what? I, I kind of feel like I've got a better offer right now. Now, intellectually, my iPhone isn't quite as amazing as I think it is, but, you know, I wake up and I've got to start pressing on it. There's just other things that keep us from the kingdom of God, and that's exactly what's going on with these guys. Jesus is speaking this parable against the religious leaders who basically believed they had a better offer. Again, verse 3, and we'll continue on from there. It says, he, he sent his servants, the king sent his servants to those who'd been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent more of his servants and said, tell those who've been invited, I've prepared my dinner, my, my oxen and fattened cattle, they've been butchered, everything is ready, come to the wedding banquet. The cow's getting cold, it's time to eat some steaks, come and feast. Verse five, but they paid no attention and went off. One to his field, another to his business. One to her doctoral studies. Another to his garage. My friends, how often do we live as though we have a better offer than walking with the living God? Man, that's dumb. That's just silly. We see in the story that some of the people who invited, they were simply indifferent, but others were openly hostile. Openly hostile. They didn't want the king interrupting their schedules. They didn't want the king interfering with their lives. Verse 6, it says, okay, so some of them, they just went off and did their thing. Verse 6, the rest, they seized his servants, they mistreated them, and they killed them. 
And again, this draws on the imagery that we looked at last week where we, got, we basically got a history lesson about the nation of Israel and how they had responded to God's rebuke. How they had responded to the prophets who had, who had come and say, you're, you're living for nothing, you're, you're living silly, come back to the feast. And what did they do? They said, no, we don't want to live under the rule and reign of God. So they mistreated the prophets. Sometimes they killed the prophets. And then we saw in the parable last week, ultimately God sent his son. And what Jesus is saying like three days before it happened is that ultimately they are going to mistreat and they are going to kill the son. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. And in the story of the people of of the kingdom, it seems that somehow they believed that they were going to get away with it. They believed that they could do whatever they want. They had no respect for the king. They had no fear of the king. They paid no honor to the king. Yeah, the king tells us what he wants us to do, and then we do what we want. Hey, let let me show you what we can get away with. Let's up the ante. We're not just going to ignore him. No, we're going to kill the messengers that he sent. What's the king going to do to us? That's Jesus' picture of the nation of Israel. And frankly, we could, we could apply that picture throughout the ages. We could apply that picture to the present age. So what is the king going to do when, when his, his subjects don't treat him with respect, when they, when they openly rebel, when they are so radically wicked? How will the king respond to such hostility and rebellion? Verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And scholars debate, okay, is this, is this like the, the Babylonian captivity? Is, is, this the, is this the Assyrian captivity? Is this something that happened a couple hundred years before Jesus with the Maccabean revolt? Is this, is this when the Romans have already come? Is this when the Romans will come a few years later in AD 70? I don't know. We could apply this to lots of times when God has in the past put down the rebellion. And we could apply it to the future when God will one day put down the rebellion. But he is a God of justice and he does put down the rebellion. But what about the feast? What about the wedding banquet? Isn't isn't that the joyful occasion that we really came here to talk about? So the city's burning and and he just kind of leaves the city burning and he jumps back to the topic of the feast. Verse 8, then the king said to his servants, the wedding banquet is ready. But those I invited did not deserve to come. Which is extremely ironic because, again, he's speaking this parable against the Jewish religious establishment. They're the people who said in their hearts, we deserve to come. We so deserve to come that we're not even sure that we're going to come. Because, eh, I, I don't know if you can throw a party that's worthy of us. Maybe there's better offers that have come into our lives, okay? They, were, they felt like they were too worthy to come In an ironic twist, Jesus says, no, you guys aren't worthy at all. You think you're righteous. You think you're holy. You think you deserve a place at the messianic banquet table. But what they don't understand is that by rejecting Jesus... They proved that in the, in the one way that mattered, they did not deserve a place at the table. Because that's the only test that matters. For the traditional religious conservative, for the legalist, they think that there's a lot of different tests. Who did you sleep with? Oh, pass that test. Did you cheat on your taxes? Well, not, no, no, no. probably not. I I passed the test, okay? They think that there's a thousand different tests to pass. And and they go through their checklist and say, yeah, passed it, passed it, passed it, passed it. Then God comes to them and says, there is only one test. There is only one question on this test. And it is, what will you do with my son? Do you believe that you have a desperate need for his mercy? Do you believe that he can bring you joy? Or are you counting on yourself and your own merit and looking to something else in the creation for your joy? What will you do with Jesus? Are you eager to feast with Jesus? Do you trust in Jesus? Do you hope in Jesus? Do you want to be with him? 
That's the test, and these guys failed the test. So the king sends out his servants to find other people who actually desire to join his son at the banquet. In verse 9, he tells, he tells his servants, go. And when we hear go, if, if you've been a part of the church for a while, if you know how the story of the Gospel of Matthew ends, your mind needs to jump forward six chapters. In this go, you need to hear an echo of the next go. You need to hear the Great Commission. Right before Jesus ascends into heaven, he tells his disciples, go, preach the gospel to all nations, make disciples of all nations. This is a mini go, looking forward to a bigger go. The king tells his servants, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. The religious establishment, they felt that they were deserving. Jesus declared them undeserving. And, and then he, he, he twists the dagger just a little bit more. He adds insult to injury by inviting people who everyone agreed was undeserving. He says, you think you're deserving? I've declared you undeserving. Now here's what I'm going to do. I'm hitting the streets. I'm sending out my servants. They're going to the wrong side of the tracks. They're going to the, to the rough side of town. We're inviting the prostitutes and the pimps and the johns. We're, 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 we're going to Liberty Plaza. We're going to the viaducts, the, the, the overpasses. We're, we're finding the homeless men, the homeless women. We're inviting everybody in. We're going to the casinos. We're going to the clubs. We're going to the bars. We're going to the brothels. Everybody gets an invite. Both good and bad, everyone was invited in, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. Again, this go, it foreshadows a later go. I, I don't want us to miss that. In, in this go, there's an urgency because the wedding feast is ready. Literally, Jesus Christ, the bridegroom, has come to the city of Jerusalem, and it is time for the religious establishment to respond to the invitation to the wedding. There's a profound urgency in that day, but there is an equally profound urgency in our day to fill the banquet hall, to invite people in. Today, as we share the invitation, man, I, I, want, I want the words of the Apostle Paul in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 to echo in your mind where he says, today, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. There is an urgency that still exists. Likewise, there is an intentionality that is still required. We need to hit the streets. We need to share this hope. One amazing note, one more before we move on. What I want us to see is that in the rejection of the Jewish establishment, this was God's sovereign mean to open, open up the floodgates to the nations. Because many of the Jews, because the Jewish leadership, because the Jewish establishment rejected him, he, he turns as he intended from all eternity past to turn. He turns and he opens up the invitation to the nations. He opens up the invitation to us. My friends, if you can't see it, we are the blind and the lame, the beggars. We are the people who get the second string invite because the first string didn't want to be there. And praise God for his grace. That in, that in his eternal sovereignty, he knew I'm inviting those people in. And man, we are among them. It's a beautiful thing. So we have this wedding feast. It's been, it's been completely turned on its head. Instead of the high society people that you'd expect to be invited to a royal wedding getting in, it's a completely different group of people who got in. There's an incredible diversity of people, the rich and the poor, the young and the old, lighter skin, darker skin, with an emphasis on the people who were least expected to be invited to the party. But most surprisingly, and, and, and certainly most surprisingly to the religious establishment, is the moral diversity of the crowd. That they gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. Because again, the, the, the Pharisees believed that you had to be a good person to get in. You had to earn your way into the kingdom of God. But as the parable continues, it's like, no, 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 that's not how it is. Anybody can get in. The good can get in. The bad can get in. 
Now, initially, like, like we've got this, this, this legalistic, moralistic, traditional religion, do better, try harder, earn your way in kind of thing. And they are getting thunderously shot down by Jesus. But, but at this point in the story, it seems like the liberal, the liberal side of it, what I would call the other ditch, it, it seems like they're winning the day. It seems like what Jesus is saying, yeah, the good and the bad, everybody gets in. No qualification to get in. You know, there is no hell. Everybody gets in. That is not what I'm saying. For those listening at home, there is a hell. And we're about to get that because there is, there is a plot twist that's about to happen. This, this is a gift of grace. It's absolutely free. It's absolutely wonderful. And yet you are going to need to be qualified to get in. Verse 11. Okay, so we got this, this diverse gathering at the feast. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Okay, this is weird. What's going on here? Everyone was just pulled in off the streets, right? Okay, this, this, guy, this guy was sitting under the highway a few minutes ago, and now he's been drugged into the wedding feast. Wouldn't you think that nobody would be wearing wedding clothes? Why is it that this guy is being singled out for not wearing wedding clothes? What's going on? One of the things that we see culturally and one of the things that's implied in the story, at times when, when a rich person or a king held a feast, at times one of the things like, like if we go to a wedding, maybe there's a little party favor there, maybe there's, maybe there's um, a candle or something at the table, something you get to take home as a memento. Back in the day when they're going big and they're having a big party, sometimes among other things, they're actually providing clothing for the event. Like, you want to come? You, you, you can't dress fancy enough to be a part of this party. I'm going to clothe you. And that certainly seems to be the case here because, again, one person is singled out for not wearing wedding clothes out of a crowd of people, none of whom had time to go home and change, none of whom probably had the means to dress appropriately for this sort of event. So, so why is it that this guy is not wearing wedding clothes and everyone else is? What seems to be the case is that, is that when they came through the door, they were given wedding clothes. When they came through the door in, 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 their, in their raggedy and ridiculous clothing, the king's servant said, here, let me clothe you in something royal. Let me clothe you in something majestic. What does that stand for? What does that mean? It's like our entrance into the kingdom of heaven. Entrance into the rule and reign of God. We don't come on our, in, on our own merit. We don't come dressed in finery of our own making. No, we come looking raggedy and ridiculous. And, and then God, he clothes us with the righteousness of his son. Jesus Christ, who became a man who lived the life we were supposed to live, who, who died the death we deserve to die, in order that his righteousness could be given to us as a gift. Okay? In the moment that we enter the kingdom, in the moment that we, we enter the wedding feast, he clothes us with the righteousness of Jesus. Imagine the woman who comes in with her rags. She knows she looks terrible. She knows that she's unworthy. She has no makeup. She has no whatever, okay? And she's handed the most, the most beautiful and majestic wedding gown that you could ever imagine. It's a free gift. She doesn't, have, she doesn't deserve it. She does not have to earn it. But what does she say in her heart? Her, her identity shifts a little bit. She says, I've been invited into the wedding of the king. From this moment forward, I want to walk in a manner that's worthy of my king. When I go to this banquet, I'm going to enjoy this banquet. I'm going to live like a, like, like a person who ought to be wearing a dress like this one. That's the picture of the Christian life. We are clothed with the righteousness of Christ, and then we live out the righteousness of Christ. Not in our own merit, and, and, and not to earn merit. We do it in response to the lavish grace of God. Now, what's going on with this guy? He got to the door. They, they, they look at his raggedy and ridiculous clothing and, and they offer him a fine tuxedo. What does he do? Eh, I think I look good. Now, if you know me very well, you know that I'm not a guy who likes to dress up. Like, this is it. 
unless somebody dies or somebody I really love is getting married, th- this is about as dressy as I get. You know, I, I put on a, a, a collar on Sunday morning because I know that there's something culturally appropriate there. And I don't care what you guys wear. Bring your t-shirt, preferably a Cubs t-shirt, not a Cardinals t-shirt. But I, I know that in our culture, as a guy who's going to stand up and preach the word of God, there's, there's this cultural idea that, that, that I should dress up at least a little bit, that I should dress up maybe a little bit more than average. And what that does is it communicates honor. It, it communicates like the respect that I have for the word of God in our culture. And that's why I do it. Now, every other day of the week, I'm wearing a Cubs t-shirt or I'm wearing a Ann Arbor Huron High School River Rats t-shirt or I'm wearing a Nike sweatshirt if it starts to get cold that probably also has a Huron logo or a Cubs logo or something like that on that. Okay, but I recognize that, that one day a week, it's appropriate to wear a collared shirt for me, Okay. What this guy says in the moment, he is, he is offered the wedding clothes and he says, you know what? This, this, I can't be bothered by this. this. This event is not so important that I need to change my clothes. What is this picture? This picture is the person who comes to Jesus and, and who, not like the Pharisees saying, hey, we really deserve this, we've earned this, look at our resume. But basically like the, the, the modern theological liberal that says, hey, everyone gets in and there's nothing that needs to change with me, okay? It's not that I have a ton of merit. Eh, who, who really cares about that? But, but God is this pushover who lets everybody in and they can do whatever they want. And, and it's really not all that amazing that I've been invited to the feast. So I'm just gonna wear what I wear. And what does God say to that man? Friend, friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. There's no reason for it. Yeah, he's poor. Sure, he doesn't own wedding clothes. Sure, he didn't have time to change. But the king had made provision for all of that. The king had offered the righteousness of his son in order to clothe that man. And the man said, no, I don't think I need the righteousness of your son in order to be invited to the party. What does God say to that man? Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. My friends, it is a picture of hell. Verse 14, for many are invited and few are chosen. The king rejects the man. God rejects the man. He ultimately casts him into hell saying, many are invited. The invitation is open to everybody and that's why we need to go. That's why we go to the street corners. That's that's why we go to the bad side of town. That's why we go to the nice side of town because the invitation is for everyone. That's why we take this message to the ends of the earth. Many are invited but few are chosen. Few will actually respond. Few will receive the gift and enter into the kingdom of heaven. Again, what's going on here? Why are tax collectors and prostitutes being welcomed into the kingdom of God while this guy is being cast into hell? Jesus says to the Pharisees, I know you think you deserve a spot at the table. You do not. Your merit is not enough. You must receive the merit of Jesus Christ. Jesus turns to the theological liberal who says, everybody deserves a spot at the table. There there, there is no category other than having a spot at the table. God is only love. God is not justice. God is only love. He lets everybody in. So I'm just gonna walk on in. No. No. If we reject God's gift of the righteousness of Jesus credited to our account, then we have no merit at all when we stand in his presence and we will be cast out. Tim Keller does a good job speaking to this issue. Like, what is is wrong with this approach that says everybody just gets in? Everybody's welcome, don't change a thing. What is wrong with that approach? Among many other things, one of the things that's wrong with it is it offers no hope for the world. 
Because the world needs to change. The world is broken. The world is sinful. I am broken. You are sinful. We need to change. Look at the world. Look at the injustice. Look at the hatred. I'm not encouraging you to watch the news in the next month. That's a downer. But the way that we treat each other during election season, you think that doesn't need to change? The injustice, the racism, the oppression, the cruelty, the hatred that we have for one another, God says that needs to change. And I offer that you can be changed. I will credit you with the righteousness of Jesus, and I will change you from the inside out. It's okay to not be okay. It's not okay to stay there. God calls us to something different, to be clothed with his righteousness, to be welcomed in, to live under the rule and the reign of God. The world needs to change. I need to change. You need to change because we are selfish. We are broken. We are sinful. We are a huge part of the problem. And the God that we see in Scripture offers true hope for the world by changing us from the inside out. Amen? The biblical God says, I will make every wrong right. I will square everything. Every injustice will be paid for. He says there's one or two ways it can be paid for. You can pay for your own injustices and sin and rebellion in hell. Or it can all be cast on the back of Jesus Christ, and he can settle your account for you. That is the lavish grace of God. That is our hope in this world. Unlike traditional religion, Jesus says you don't earn your place in God's kingdom. But he also rejects the modern idea that God just accepts everyone and leaves them as they are. If you believe that God accepts everyone and leaves them as you are, then he says, you are the guy who's walking into the banquet in your own clothing. And what does he do to that man? He binds him hand and foot and he throws him into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is our fate unless we repent. All right. The text ends there. I don't want to end there. Okay? The text ends in hell. I do not want to end in hell. Amen? I want to end with joy. There's a rejection of traditional religion. There's a a rejection of modern liberalism. We don't want to be, we don't want to be either of those because both of those, the wedding crasher and the guy who says, you know, I've got a better offer. Both of those are missing out on the joy of the wedding feast. Who's experiencing the joy? It's the guy who was sitting at Liberty Plaza a few minutes ago. It's the guy who was, who was sitting under the viaduct at the highway a few minutes ago. It's the guy who recognizes that he doesn't deserve to be at the feast. But somehow, in the lavish grace of God, he is at the feast. That, my friends, is where we want to find ourselves in the story. Spurgeon says this really well. He just, he just talks about the reality that, that, that if you invite like prim and proper, proud people to the banquet, they're lousy banquet guests. You know, they get there and it doesn't matter how lavish the spread is. It's, it's just part of their MO. It's, it's part of their pride to just kind of look at whatever wonderful things are laid out by the king of the banquet and say, eh, it's okay. It's okay. You know, one, one, one guy, he's, he's, he's biting into the steak and it's just so ridiculously juicy and, and like his, his eyes are smiling with the flavor of that steak and he turns to the other guy, can you believe this? He's like, yeah, yeah, it's okay. He, here's what Spurgeon says about it. He says, invite the beggars to the feast. Because with the beggars, they are going to cheer for every dish. Here comes more steak. Here comes some mashed potatoes. The pies are coming. The pies are coming. Praise God, the pies are coming. My friends, is that how we live? Do we recognize that we are beggars who have been invited to the feast? I tell you, more than any other day of the week, this is my Saturday. 
I, I've told you this before. I am sappy on Saturdays because I procrastinate too much and I work on my sermon all week, but the bulk of the work gets done on Saturday. Okay? So what does that mean? It means that I spend half of my Saturday marinating in the grace of God. And, and I walk around my house like this sappy idiot telling my kids how much I love them and how much I delight in them and what a great gift it is to have them. And, and I, I just enjoy my day like none other. Because my heart is just fill, so filled up with the grace of God. I, I know I'm a beggar. I know that I'm at a lavish feast. It's beautiful, my friends. Can we live this way? Will we live this way? Will we humble ourselves? Will we recognize this is a privilege? This is a feast. Praise God we're invited to the feast. And will we pound the streets and invite anybody and everyone, good and bad, rich and poor, young and old, whatever, complexion, will we invite them to the feast? Because praise God we have a place at the feast. Amen? Let's pray. God, please make us a people who appreciate your grace. Lord, make us a people of celebration. Lord, may the party that is Mosaic Church be a wonderful party because we, we recognize the privilege that we have to live under the rule and reign of our God. And Lord, may that party be winsome and attractive as we invite others in to share in your grace. Amen.